Hey, you know. <laughs> oh. Already <laughs> things are firing up here in the spoiler room. Welcome everyone to another edition of the spoiler room. Thank you for venturing down the stairs, pulling up a chair and getting your favorite beverage. Hey oh, I don't have not your father's root beer. I have big brother's hard root beer from Aldi, which is almost Ooh. as good as not your father's, but not your father's is so hard to find. There's like one place in all of town that sells it that uh, I was in Aldi and I'm like, Ooh, they have it. And so, you know, wow. <laughs> so. I mean, I knew, I knew marriages were falling apart all over, but now it's extended to not your father's root beer. Yeah, I know. You can't, right? you can't find any dads. <laughs> you can't find any dads. <laughs> No, you can't find any dads. Uh, but what you can find is the penultimate episode of the horror of 1988. Yes, folks, this is the second last episode that is going to be our special series of the horror of 1988. A bit bittersweet. Um, this has been a fun ride this year. I hope everybody's had a fun time listening to these horror of 1988 films and and let me tell you this was only like a third of the amount of horror that was really it 1988 was like this year as far as horror goes it was it was crazy um and you had some insane horror films as uh we've tried to bring you this year and yep we've got another insane one for you today <laughs> and with me the guy who keeps coming back for more it is none other than my right hand man and friend Mr. Ian Simmons, <laughs> how you doing? Yeah, I had to get it in there. I had to get it. In there. How you doing? I, I I appreciate that, Mark. No, I'm I'm doing great. Um, this is another. You know, keep wondering why I keep coming back. It's for experiences like this. <laughs> I, no, I'd never seen Lair of the White Worm before, as uh -huh. I think we, I revealed last week when I was astonished that Hugh Grant was in it because I had no idea. Mm -hmm. um, I'd heard of it. I'd seen like the the famous image of a man of Donahoe coming out of the you know, the, the basket, but I didn't know anything about it. I watched it this morning and I cannot wait to talk about it. I have a new cult favorite to do. <laughs> All this makes me excited. Yes. Uh, always fun when you're introducing new films, you'll be surprised that I actually had not watched this whole film before either. So really? this was a first, yeah, it was, I I'd seen bits and pieces. I had not seen the full film. Uh, until this episode, which is part of the reason why I want to do it. It was a blind spot, but Dawn, diva of the spoiler room, our good friend, she uh, definitely uh, is a big fan of this uh, movie. Uh, she wasn't able to make it tonight, but, uh, and I, she'd talk about it, you know, so I was like, okay, I f we're going to do this. All right. It was 1988. So it was perfect timing. And yeah, so here we are. Lair of the white worm starring uh, Mr. Uh, Hugh Grant. And uh, hey, we got Infobomb already in here wow. uh, with us today. Uh, so glad you joined us, Infobomb. Uh, to mention it, is it on streaming service? Yes, it is. Well, uh, not on one of the paid ones, I don't think. You've got to get... Uh, well, it's on Tubi, actually. You can watch it on Tubi. That's how you I got saw commercials. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got commercials, but you can watch it on Tubi. Or, like us physical media hounds... Oh, oh, you purchased the DVD for like nine bucks because it was paired with S so so I got <laughs> S and then it said, Hey, if you like, S you might like this. And I'm like, Wow, what a coincidence! And so I just <laughs> ordered both so I could get that free shipping. Are uh, there are there any extras on that DVD, by the way? On the layer of the white worm? Absolutely not. Okay, because there's a Blu-ray that I'm that I'm probably gonna pick up. Get the Blu-ray. Yeah. No, yeah. this it's got like like said, commentaries this was like, and making of stuff. Yeah. This was like eight bucks. So, you know, right. I, I picked it up like this was eight and was eight. So, you know, I just I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I don't have a copy of it. And at that price, sure. I probably should have got the Blu-ray. It does list as special features. And if you know DVDs, especially back in the day, prepare for your special features list widescreen version 2.0 <laughs> dolby stereo sound and scene selection interactive menu <laughs> god i love early dvds this is 2003 2003 this dvd was released i love early dvds 
interactive you know, menus. You know, on VHS tapes back in the day, they didn't say you can fast forward. <laughs> no more reel to reel, kids. Um, I just love that that how it, it's in widescreen is one of the special features, and that and scene selection. They're right. There literally are only two menu options: play movie and scene selection. That's it. <laughs> that's all that's on the DVD. You know, I got uh, there. There's a bit of a tease because one of the other places you can watch it is actually the Criterion channel, like the YouTube. Oh yeah, uh, or not YouTube, but on on Criterion.com, I guess. Right. I was like. Does that mean there's a Criterion Blu-ray? No, it's from some other company. I don't know how that works out. So that's and I was conflicted. I'm like, do I order the Blu-ray that's out because I think it's a few years old, or do I hold out hope that maybe someday this will get the Criterion treatment? I don't know. It might. It's weird what Criterion puts out. I mean, they put out so much more now than they used to because they found an audience and they have collectors who specifically look for criterion stuff that are just drooling for it kind of like arrow folks mm -hmm. people who buy just about anything from arrow uh, or uh, uh, uh um, vinegar syndrome they'll just buy anything regardless of the you know they're just fanatics and so uh which mad props to you physical media fans love you um as you can see so oh, yeah. <laughs> so tonight yes the lair of the white worm 1988 this is a horror of 1988 special or penultimate and ian you're the only one here uh, so <laughs> you get to give the synopsis of this film. So go for it. Um, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I was just pulling up. I was pulling up my IMDb because I want to get the names right. Um, yes. And I'll. Here's the thing. I'm working without a net because usually I take lots of notes when I watch movies. But mm -hmm. this morning I was like, I'm just gonna engage with the film like I did back in the old days. I'm just gonna retain the information and be able to talk about it knowledgeably without being an old man and having to like get out my reading glasses and look at my notes. It was a noble idea. Was um, <laughs> all right, so Peter Capaldi, a 30, this is how old I feel. I'm looking at this baby-faced Peter Capaldi and a baby-faced Hugh Grant. They were both like, I think Capaldi was 30 and Hugh Grant was like 28 or something when they made this Something movie. like that, yeah. They're very, yeah. And now you're looking at them like, oh my God, they're old gray men. Still <laughs> great actors, but it's just, it's kind of jarring to see like Peter Capaldi with like these brown, like huge curly, like late 80s locks and, you know, the, the <laughs> round <laughs> linen glasses. <laughs> Didn't he resemble, didn't mean to cut you off, but didn't he resemble Donald Sutherland, a young Donald Sutherland? A bit, in many yeah. respects, A mm -hmm. bit. I, I was like, ah, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, but it just kept throwing me off. I'm like, no, that's for Capaldi, not Sutherland. Well, the the actress who played one of the sisters, I can't remember if it was Eve or Mary, she looked to me like uh, Kate McKinnon from Saturday Night Live. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was very odd. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, so... Capaldi plays Angus Flint. Um, Angus. He, yeah, he's an aspiring Scottish archaeologist who's doing a dig on this estate that is owned by uh, the Dampton family. Uh, it's it's on their their land, and he uncovers this giant like skull. Looks like a dinosaur skull, but it's not like any reptile that they can uh, or dinosaur that they can place. <clears throat> turns out to be a giant snake skull and furthermore there was a a cult uh, this is where it gets really kind of convoluted so i'm going to butcher this i might need to rely on you for some of the facts but sure, at one sure. point hundreds of years ago there was a snake worshiping cult that was taken over by conquered by the romans who then right. incorporated elements of that religion into their own uh mm -hmm. religion imagery and the creature that that cult worshipped still lives underneath this village and there's a, a lady of the estate there named sylvia who is out of town a lot but occasionally she drop, drops back in and she does in the time frame of this movie and she is essentially uh, this this movie is based on a book by bram stoker and it totally shows this is Imagine if Dracula was a snake god instead of just a regular <laughs> vampire, because she has like these, she takes on these snake like visage and she can, you know, poison people and turn people into snake monsters. And she's looking for virgins to sacrifice to this snake god to, I guess, appease it. And hey, there up, you go. Yeah. It's up to uh, Angus Flint and Angus. 
and Lord James Dumpton, played by Hugh Grant, um, <laughs> and these two sisters who own the estate on which this, um, or own the cottage, the, the bed and breakfast is what it is, mm -hmm. um, that this skull was found on, Mary and Eve, going back to the biblical references, it's up to them to stop Sylvia before she can, you know, take over the world or whatever she wants to do. <laughs> she wants to raise her god is what she wanted she wanted to raise the, the so it the, can take over the world and, so it yeah. could take over the right she, it, it was her god uh, the snake god um and yeah yeah you know that that was pretty good that's thank that's you pretty much what goes on in this film uh <laughs> i was not prepared for this to mm -hmm. be a horror comedy did you oh really know that, did you know that yeah. about this yeah i, I did had no idea, idea. Uh, yeah, I, cause I mean, just even looking at the, at the poster, not the box art on the DVD. Cause that's just like, Hey, Hugh Grant was in this. We'll put, right. We'll make it look like <laughs> some kind of like a, a mystery. That was their marketing. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're, oh, maybe the lay of the white worm is like a, a diamond smuggler. And he's going to romance this fine young lady played by <laughs> Amanda Donahoe as they travel to, to France. No. Um, it reminded me a lot of, um, what you might call it dead alive. The Peter oh, Jackson yeah. movie yeah. come out yeah. a couple yeah. years mm -hmm. after this, right? Um, small village, kind of innocent people uh, faced by supernatural atrocities, and they've got to deal with the with the mania of it all. Mm -hmm. This movie is very funny. It's very screwed up. It's the kind of thing that I would almost want them to remake today if they promised to stick with the spirit of the original. Um, because the only reason I think think it needs to be updated is because of some of these fantasy sequences that we see. Whew, They're rendered yeah. in 1988 effect <laughs> technology. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Those uh, were, were a bit rough. I mean, they were nightmare on their own quality, much less what was being portrayed in the visuals in those nightmare. But I think, I mean, I think the visuals, the idea behind the visuals was, mm -hmm. was great. You know, you've got mm -hmm. like a crucified Jesus and then you've got this giant snake wrapping itself around the crucifix. You've got like, I was going to call it a Roman orgy, but it's, uh, shall we say, more forcible than that. Um, you have this other sequence where Hugh Grant is like boarding a plane and th the snake imagery is off the chain in this movie. At one point when he's on that plane, he's kind of trapped by the seat belts that are all wrapped around him and realize that's sort of like a snake metaphor um amanda donahoe's costumes alone should have won some kind of a bafta or an academy award because just the imagination of you know from the colors in the, her two-tone glasses to the different kind of patterns that she wears like a, she wears a plaid coat or a plaid dress at some point that kind of looks like scales without being overt i mean it's a i think this is a really outstanding film minus some of the dated qualities like right okay let's not remake it but if someone could do like a george lucasy kind of like let's just go in and for these few scenes we're gonna make this look redo. actually good <laughs> yeah redo redo the nightmare scenes yeah because her character does spit venom and if you touch the venom it causes these hallucinogenic uh uh flashbacks and such and, and give you some visuals that these the nightmare fuel stuff uh that you end up getting or if you get bit as well it'll give you these nightmare scenes that yeah are a nightmare in their quality uh, they do show their date um it reminds you know, me of what, another 1988 movie that we watched or talked about hellbound hellraiser 2 yeah and when, when they're in hell and uh, i think it was dr chenard he gets these visions these flashes of these kind yeah. of weird psychedelic like bits of his past mix, mixed with hell imagery it's very much like that but when again when touching the venom gets like a you touch it and there's a shock and all of a sudden you're tripping out <laughs> yeah uh you know it, it i i dig this movie too you're right i i think i can see why it's definitely got the cult following the humor was was worked in well because this is this is very heavily british obviously so the humor when you say humor you might be going in thinking, oh, ha ha. So, no, this is more a bit of some dry, satirical British humor in here more so than, say, your straight up, um, you know, uh, more abrupt comedy that you might have from the West. Namely, because it was hilarious because early on, there's an early scene where Angus, I love that name. I just love that they gave the Scottish guy the name Angus, right? Uh, Peter Capaldi. 
And uh, one of the sisters ends up going to the party that's being held by uh, Lord James de, de Ampton, uh, you know, Hugh Grant. And they're at a they're at a banquet table and they're eating and they're talking about this legend of the white worm who where de Ampton's family uh, descended killed the white worm that was near their land. And he's eating the, these like noodles things while he's eating. They're talking about worms. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting imagery. And then they, De Ampton goes, oh, yeah, I hope you like these pickled worms. We got. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's jokes like that. Um, you know, there's, uh, oh, I'm going to put it out there right now. Amanda Donahoe is amazing in this film. Like, wow like this character she's more badass when she's not a snake than when she is a snake <laughs> yeah i mean it is kind of like in stills the snake imagery works really great right yeah but in action it just does kind of come off as kind of like yeah just go back to you were more intimidating and cool when you were just a you know a manipulating you know a snake a reptilian like lady yeah. uh yeah i I knew Amanda Donahoe from watching L.A. Law of all things. Oh well, yeah, sure. Because <laughs> she showed up on that series like a, like a year or two after this movie came out. Um, right. I'm like, oh, she's she's great on that show, and then she was in this other weird worm movie. I don't know what that's about, but yeah, she's phenomenal. I was thinking about Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Francis Ford Coppola mm -hmm. movie that we talked about on Scarathon last month, and and how I don't think that movie holds up at all this is the better dracula movie i think if you're gonna watch one because it's got it's i'm watching this and i haven't read the book layer the white worm i'm mm -hmm. kind of curious now but it's got all the kind of dracula templates it essentially is dracula except with snake imagery and mythology worked right. in but it works so well down to you know the two the two guys who are trying to figure things out and the two girls in this case their sisters instead of best friends who kind of get mm -hmm. like caught up in this whole thing to varying degrees um yeah they even have a renfield type character the the cop who gets turned um it's brilliant and it just works so well this this is the movie that should get the recognition as opposed to that <laughs> coppola thing yeah it, it's just interesting with the title and you look at some of the stills you're like okay yeah whatever you know and kind of <clears throat> 80s horror but it does work. The majority of this film and this story really works <laughs> better than you might expect. There's actually a bit of intrigue. I mean, our two, uh, the two sisters we have, their parents disappeared earlier. And you're like, oh, that's that's sad. And then we meet Lady Sylvia, and you're like, well, I know what happened to the parent. <laughs> I mean, you 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 forget pretty much because she's inquiring about the parents. Oh, you found a watch, really? After the parents have been gone a year. You know, uh, and they give you these tidbits throughout uh, as the film goes along of you learn more about the legend and the area, uh, the Roman, you know, empire, the imagery. And it starts to all come together far better than you might expect from a film like this. <laughs> they, they really had the story worked out with with the white worm and, and you know, her character and, and kind of the motivation of what she was doing uh and yeah the way they everything all the characters kind of come together and work out it it it's fun it's fun to watch this this story unravel the way it does it is fun I, and what i like is that they really commit to the worm snake mm -hmm. thing from that that party that you mentioned it begins with this really banging like almost like a scottish folk song and then yeah. they have a giant almost like the the japanese uh, dragons that they bring mm -hmm. out during the parades with like a bunch of people in them they have that but it's a giant worm that hugh grant's character uh, he quote unquote slays it by cutting it in half and it's a yeah. neat effect to see the people kind of separate because that's part of the legend of his family that one of his ancestors apparently did that to this giant you know dragon mm -hmm. snake worm thing um i thought it was kind of fun that at the end of the movie you're expecting him to step in with the sword and and slay the demon monster by by cutting it in half and no capaldi just nukes it with a grenade <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah is uh chinese robert infobomb said don't you mean chinese the uh probably uh, I'm, i've had very little sleep the, the dance um uh yeah no uh, with the dragon dancing it did remind me a lot of that 
um and the, the committing to the imagery it shows up everywhere the worm and and they even they even throw in a little tidbit for those who might not get it that yes white worm even though they say worm has been applied to like dragon and snake we even get lord uh, de Ompton explaining this a little bit to the characters uh aka to them so it can explain to the audience yeah we call it white worm because we didn't want to say white snake <laughs> because then we'd have a band and copyright infringement exactly and the, like layer of the white snake and then white snakes like damn it why didn't we think of that <laughs> album that's an album title right there and then you know it's a whole thing so they call it layer of the white worm that's the only thing that would make this movie even better was a white snake soundtrack <laughs> imagine if they had been the ones on stage doing that that folk song <laughs> <laughs> oh damn it now i now i want to see that i want to see white snake <laughs> forget the cat's butthole cut i want the white snake white worm <laughs> cut. white snake <laughs> white worm cut yes um you know it, with the comedy in here that you you do get the disturbing features it, it's this it's like amalgamation of of a of a, a hammer horror almost with some exploit extra exploitation elements in it in in many ways with the way the characters are especially uh you know especially with uh your your villainous sylvia who again she's just phenomenal it's like amanda donahoe talk about screen presence whenever her character is just in a scene you're just like as the human you're just like damn you know she, she's just so much confidence comes through the screen um what, what caught me too what i found interesting is that yes you, you have you don't have as much nudity as you might think uh, until you get to like the very end but there there's still managed to capture the sensuality and that's partly through like you said some of the wardrobe choices they choose and just amanda donahoe's uh at performance because she ends up picking up uh this poor uh, uh young man who was just trying to get to the youth hostel and and she ends up you know picking him up and taking him back to the mansion to play uh snakes and ladders which is an actual game folks oh, yeah. before mm -hmm. before shoots and ladders it's i believe it was called snakes and ladders uh which yeah i mean the snake imagery is everywhere and she doesn't hide it and then she's like, oh, you want to you want a bath? The bath is ready. And she's dressed in some lingerie, you know, uh, with these like knee high freaking boots. And this guy's dressed in like he's dressed in like a, a grandma robe. almost. <laughs> like, well, that was that was the other thing that when I talk about committing to the bit, uh, what what is she primarily wearing throughout this movie? Mm -hmm. Garters. Yes garters she she has <laughs> garters on in fact the the young man notices the garters as do just about any other man uh notice garters uh, that she she has no problems showing just a little bit of because she knows uh you know and she's hungry and uh yeah you know she she wants to take a bite out of someone and she knows how to lure her prey in uh, well it's it's nice too because when she does attack him i mean he's sitting in this you know, giant bath or whatever, and she strikes, and then she just gets out. And I think she takes a phone call at this point or something. Yeah, um, yeah. But he's just completely paralyzed, and she's describing what is going on with his body as it's happening. You just realize, I mean, he's he does such a great job of of acting because you can tell he's still alive. But even like the only thing that kind of breaks the illusion is when she pushes down on his head to submerge him yeah. under the water. I mean, his body just goes completely down. But his eyes are open. <laughs> but then when they go under, they they close. close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it yeah. would have been that. That's the other thing they can fix. And the rework, the remastered version of this is to digitally just make it so his eyes stay open all the way. Stay open. <laughs> yeah. But um, but no, the thing about that's so sensual about Amanda Donahoe's character, and partially I think this comes down to to Ken Russell and some of the choices that were made in the filming and the editing. Um, you know, when she's picking him up. And they're driving back to the estate. We get a couple of shots of he. The boy notices that her kind of jacket is open. You can see her thigh with those with the mm -hmm. garters and stockings. And that's so hot. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the thing. Like it's it's more erotic and and more evokes the idea of you know you're a horny teenage boy 
you're going to be turned on by any bit of flesh that you're not supposed mm -hmm. to see. It doesn't have to be, what? you know, rampant, like ripping a bodice ripper or whatever. It can be just that little hint of leg that that's mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, I don't need to go to the youth hostel anymore. I'll go back to your place. Sure. <laughs> well, and, and there's always been jokes, especially, I mean, if you listen to John Oliver's monologue a lot of times and other folks and even through the years about how uh, somewhat repressed the culture overall in, in, in British culture, you know, as far as that goes, you know, they try to be very proper, uh, <laughs> you, you know, and and not necessarily stuffy, but, you know, just proper and gentlemanly and whatnot. And then you come to find out, no, they're just a, everybody's a bunch of horn dogs. But no, <laughs> but on the surface, you know, they're, they're supposed to act a certain way. And yeah, it just any little bit. Um, and that's what's interesting with our character is, is that uh, there's not actually, like I said, uh, until the very, like the final act where she's in snake form, there's only like un one other really like blatant naked scene. Otherwise she's either j in, in some kind of wardrobe that just, you know. Yeah. There was, there was the tanning bed scene, but even that was yeah, but more even suggested that. than, um, you know, and, and that, yeah. and the scene was also about, you know, other things rather than just like, Hey, look at me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, her character in general just is just wonderful, wonderful, strong character throughout, really. Well, she looks I mean, she's not not only the actress, but the character she's playing looks like she's having fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't get a lot of that. In, you know, maybe Jerry Dandridge from Fright Night. But uh, a lot of the times these. Oh, oh, I'm just so tortured about living forever. And, you know, mm -hmm. oh, it's, oh, it's just the, the weight of everything. No. Sylvia is having fun. Uh, part of it is, you know, arrogance because she kind of swoops in and out of town and she can she knows she can use her her charms and her frankly, her hypnotic abilities mm -hmm. on people to get food and get whatever she wants. Plus, she talks about how she's immortal. She can never be killed because she believes that. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's just she's just having a great time with it. You know, it's uh, I was I was blown away <laughs> by this performance. It, by her performance and by the way the character was written. I mean, for the film, the type of film this is, you do not quite expect a character like this. She just, she she exudes confidence every time you see her. There's not really a, a, a point even where she's, like, afraid for herself until, like, the very, very end. Yeah. Very end, you know, which it was great to see. I mean, there's otherwise, even when she... And I, they play with the music and the committing to the snake gimmick. At one point, our our soon to be a victim of hers, the the boy, the, the young teen going to the youth hostel, plays the the uh, mouth. There's even a joke in here, just a subtle joke, to where she asks if he plays any instruments, and he goes, what "Was it? I play the uh, mouth organ." I play I play the mouth organ and she just gets the smirk on her face. <laughs> and I'm just like that. That is what I love is there's comedy written in here. That is just is like that. It's not necessarily like hit you in the face punchline, but there's reactions and subtleties to it that, and some nuance to some, a, a lot of the humor in here that you're just like, well, I mean, and then there's something kind of more in, in your face. Like you said, there's the dream sequence with Hugh Grant where uh, uh, he's the only live person on this plane uh, as he's hallucinating because uh, uh, Sylvia has entered his dreams to kind of seduce him. And at one point, yeah, he is trapped and Sylvia is a stewardess and there's another stewardess. And they start fighting with one another. And he was holding his pen because he was doing a crossword puzzle. And the the pen. pen is. I was pen. hoping you would bring up the pen. The, the like, pen is. Wow. Horiz the pen is horizontal. And as the ladies are fighting, clothed, okay, they're just, they're fighting with each other. He, he brings the pen slowly up. It's embarrassing and it's genius. I can't figure it out. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you're like at the same like going, oh my god, and then on the other end, you're like, oh, that's brilliant. That's 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 way to get your idea across, <laughs> you know, to get around the censors because we know we know about especially uh British cinema, the the censors really go after some films, and so to get around it, yeah, you have two clothes ladies just fighting, and he's just holding his pen, which he just happens to start. <laughs> 
to raise or a uh, vertical. <laughs> It's, it's, this is Cinema Serpentes. It is right? Cinema yeah. Serpentes. That's right. Uh, we'll pull over here just for a little bit. Info Bob been dropping some bombs. Uh, he said it was rather ironic that Hugh Grant dealt with the serpent in this film, and years later he was deemed a worm when he was busted. Yeah. Oh, those Vestron memories. Yes, this was a Vestron <laughs> actual studios for a short amount of time. Vestron Studios put out films, and this was one of them. He also said Vestron wasn't exactly the company for Tame Fair, save perhaps for Dirty Dancing. Of course, uh, the name Ken Russell. And uh, yeah, and then he said, it is, uh, there is a Blu-ray. The Blu-ray does have a commentary track from Ken Russell, which is always great. Uh, he said Oxenberg was looking to be regarded as a legit actress. Catherine Oxenberg was the one that played Eve, one of the was two. She, was she not a legit actress? I'm, I'm not sure i i didn't recognize her from too many things but she's been she was in a lot of stuff uh she was in dynasty uh just before this and on a number of episodes of the love boat <laughs> oh um, well and maybe it's because she was i guess she was a model uh she she's, is the daughter yeah. of uh her royal highness princess elizabeth of yugoslavia wow okay. oh wow yeah but she's been in a number of uh, uh, of films for sure. Uh, oh, she was in Starship Troopers Three: Marauder, uh, uncredited though. She was an extra in that. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, she still stayed. You know, hey, Acapulco yeah. Heat. There you go. There's a, the TV show. Uh, if you remember that, so maybe that's what uh, Info Bomb meant by that. But she she was a regular on Donahue, so I uh, on a Dynasty, not Donahue. Uh, so there is that. <laughs> She was almost a regular on Donahoe, too. Donahoe, yeah, she almost was a regular on Donahoe. <laughs> and then he said, Sammy Davis, he thinks she was Mona Lisa and uh, Bob Hoskins' niece in A Prayer for the Dying. Uh, yeah, uh, Sammy Davis in here, who plays the other sister, uh, she plays Eve, I believe. Um, she she was in a lot of stuff as well. There's a lot of veteran actors who, you know, some of them were veterans and some of them were early starts in their career in this film. It's kind of impressive to see where many of them went. Um, and he said the poster on Wikipedia entry does not carry a hint of humor, which is funny because, I, yeah, you know, like we mentioned going into this. And even when you see the trailer, you're like, yeah, it doesn't necessarily seem comical, but there's comedy like we with the with the bath scene where she pushes uh the young man down to the water it's like he's going to be her victim uh but at the same time james de ampton ended up showing up at the house and so uh she pushes this guy down into the water because she thought maybe she had a sacrifice for her god which was the skull that was unearthed by angus um i'm sorry i just can't say <laughs> he just <laughs> It's like, What's your oh, beef man. with Angus, Mark? It's no, not. I'm... I love. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. Well, well played there, sir. No, I, I, I love the name. That's why I just. It's such a. You know, I'm Mark. Uh, you know, that's the uh, the bark of a hair lip dog. But he's Angus. You know, that's got weight to it. You know, uh, <laughs> so, and uh, yes, the cop who played uh, the cop played the rancor keeper in return of the Jedi. That's I so, thank you. That's Robert, where we've seen was, him from. Yeah. That was one of those. And I didn't look it up, but I was like, I Paul know Brooke. that face. I, <laughs> I was not used to seeing him uh, with a shirt on and not covered in dirt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess that was the... <laughs> the cop character was definitely an interesting one. And, and all honesty, I did not see the turn literally and, and figuratively of his character coming uh necessarily i mean he played a little bit of a shifty guy but you didn't expect him to fully be like full-on disciple <laughs> but uh what was even more interesting though is i loved how i think it was uh eve figured it out uh fairly quick that he was uh because mary was the one i think that got captured and it was eve was the one that uh was looking for her how she figured out that he was uh uh, under the influence of Sylvia. <laughs> I, I like how they, you know, had her figure that out and she didn't become a complete, like, clueless victim. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, up until the the very end where 
you've got the the ladies tied up in the you know, in chains in the cave and one of them is you know barely dressed yeah that that this movie keeps it together right up until like the penultimate 10 minutes and then there's like yes like five minutes where it's like eh, and then it kind of comes back around and it has a strong finish which i like yeah it, that that's what i was gonna say is i mean up until then because you know we've get we get the idea that Sylvia is seducing them. She realizes that I believe it is uh, Eve is the virgin. So she ends up uh, ensnaring her to be the sacrifice to her God because virgins are hard to find nowadays. Apparently. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, uh, with we get to this ending and Angus, we hadn't seen him for a little while. And then we realize, you know, he said he was going to do some more research. And then suddenly he shows up with bagpipes. It's 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 a beautiful thing. Well, <laughs> not yeah. just bagpipes. He's in full Scottish garb. Oh, yeah. And he's he's kind of uh, he's drawing out the the cop. <clears throat> and they have that mm -hmm. whole like face off, like luring him out onto the steps. And uh, because as we learned, yeah, the, the music the depending on what kind of music it is, has a very strange effect on these, these snake servants, right. um, you know, kind of hypnotizes them as, you know, we've seen in other, you know, stories and things. Um, so yeah, it's just like, I love the imagination in this movie. And when I say committing to the snake thing, like, yeah, we're going to make a movie about snake vampires. Well, what all could that involve? We're going to put it all into this movie. It, it's going to work. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, there's no such thing as, as too much in this movie, although it does feel like on paper it should be excessive. In practice, it's a it's a pretty tight, you know, 90 minutes. Yeah, it is. It is a tight 90 minutes. Um, it moves along and you're right. Uh, uh, you know, up until that last end part, um, it seemed uh, uh, it, to keep it together. But there, there's a part which I want to get to in just a little bit that we talk about for the end that kind of threw me off like. I think there was some things dropped on the editing uh, floor, uh, hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was wrong um, that it was actually Eve who was the one who was captured and Mary was the one who was looking after her. So that's, um, you know, it was it was tough to tell between the two because the two sisters looked very similar. So yeah, one had short it. hair and one had long hair. And <laughs> right. Yeah. That, that was that's the thing. It's like I think I'm gonna watch this movie again at some point. And mm -hmm. now that I know where it's all going and kind of who's who, I'll probably be able to keep track of the characters. But it is sort of Hugh Grant and Peter Capaldi had the advantage of being two distinctly different characters in terms of visually and right. also in terms of like class. You know, uh, Hugh Grant is essentially like British Bruce, Lord. Landlord. Yeah, he's like he's like Bruce Wayne in this movie. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and then you've got Capaldi who's like sort of this, you know, archaeology nerd. Um, but with the sisters, a they're sisters, b they're both blondes and c they're just like, yeah, like I said, one's got short hair, one's got long hair and they don't get quite as much distinction in terms of what they do necessarily. Right. As the guys do, which. I don't think it's necessarily a, a fault of the movie. I think it's just the economy. No, it's just time. when you're when you're talking about it, it's a little hard to keep track occasionally, just because uh, they are a bit interchangeable mm -hmm. as far as the way they are, and they're supposed to be. I mean, they're sisters. You know, they're very yeah. much alike, and and that's what they're going for with it. No fault at all with the film. Just trying to describe it. It's like, wait, was it Eve or was it Mary? So yeah. I apologize on that. That. Uh, you know, it, it, and it makes more sense. It, it, well, no, either way, it could be because there's some religious imagery in here that's actually helps uh, Eve break her spell uh, because uh, Sylvia meets her into the woods and she takes her back. And that's where we get the the sun tanning, the, the sun, the tanning bed scene for whatever reason. And uh, she's talking to to her about being a virgin and uh, she has her make a phone call so she can call her sister and say, hey, I'm not, you know, that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm I can't take any more of this. I just have to leave for a few days. And while she's on the phone, she's staring at her crucifix ring and the the her religion breaks her out of it, uh, out of the spell of from the white worm, because there is that devil 
you know, the snake God she's worshiping is the snake from the Garden of Eden and uh, the, the snake of knowledge, you know, tree of knowledge and all of that is talked about in here. But her her uh, crucifix ring breaks her spell uh, a bit, which was always great. Uh, I, I liked that a little bit. I didn't expect that to be, you know, what kind of broke her. So that was a big surprise. What was also interesting about her character is that her sister mentions she doesn't go to church, but she still is religious. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that's actually kind of a bold concept, even for 88. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think it's much a big deal now. Oh. But yeah, as you mentioned, yeah, for, for 88, that would have been a little, little eyebrow raising. Well, well, just bold as well for a film, too, because usually if you have a religious person, at some point you're going to get the scene with them in a church. And mm-hmm. here we find out that, yeah, she doesn't go to church, but she still has her belief, which was great to see in, the, in this film, you know, that she didn't have to go to church to to prove her faith at all. And, and that her faith ended up uh, uh, helping her a bit, um, you know, and Angus's faith in science fails him uh, because, like I said, in this finale, Angus has a plan. He knows music. They, they <laughs> It's great. Uh, De Ampton has the theory that well she's a snake and there's music so you know maybe she'll uh you know be entranced by it so he plays snake charmer music from a record that his dad had (laughs) which is a great comedic i love that scene what'd you think of that scene with him and the butler when he's talking about his dad i'm like there's your humor right there (laughs) yeah and and the poor butler um the poor butler This this movie reminded me of another film that was an out and out comedy that came out about five years. Maybe I don't even know if it was five years before this. Maybe a couple of years. Uh, Once bitten with Jim Carrey mm. and Lauren Hutton. Did you ever see that? I have. That's the one where he thinks he's a vampire. No, he actually that, becomes that, one. He's, or he does. Actually, yeah. Okay. He he and his high school friends go out to a bar in L.A. Yeah. Night, yeah. Yeah. Meet Lauren Hutton, who's a vampire, very similar to this. I was trying to think of other kind of like freewheeling carefree vampires and lauren hutton's character in that movie Mm -hmm. is very similar to what amanda donahoe has going on uh here and she's also on the hunt for for a virgin and much like this movie it's almost impossible to find especially in in los angeles (laughs) (laughs) but uh yeah but yeah the the humor is is on point i think i haven't watched once bitten in a long time Mm -hmm. so it's we were talking but, earlier about movies that probably didn't age well in terms of like appropriate humor. Um, I'm kind of afraid, but uh, yeah, I think that it's like the American humor version of what's going on in Lair of the White Worm. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. <laughs> and there's other humor as well. Uh, Infobomb mentioned he thought uh, she killed the kid because, like Stoker's famed bl- a bloodsucker, she needed to replenish her life. Actually, uh, no, it's for the, she, it was for the serpent god. It was for the serpent god. She figured this kid was a virgin, and he she was going to sacrifice him for uh, to the snake god and, and revitalize him, and that was the idea. And then she gets interrupted by by Hugh, and she's like, "Yeah, you know what? Yeah, yeah no, you're you're good." And she does this wonderful heads heads <laughs> slowly sink him into the pool with with her stiletto boot scene. And she, which it's funny because she did mention that human sacrifice was the main component of it right but if the sacrifice was not a virgin then essentially it was like junk food for the snake god right virgins are like you know that's the kale you know in the smoothie (laughs) that's gonna yeah (laughs) energize them (laughs) the virgin sacrifice is like the kale in a smoothie there you go (laughs) folks hope you enjoy your kale smoothie next time you think about yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll have an extra virgin kale smoothie. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. <laughs> oh, almost right up my nose. Oh, good job there. Uh. <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, a lot of great bits come through um, in this. You know, she she eats regular food, too. They don't talk about her sucking blood. Um you know, she just, she lives. We were not, it was hard to say whether or not she actually, uh, you think, I think she does 
survive on some human flesh of some kind, but it's hard to say because at one point, even Mary's mother shows up, not her dad, her mom shows up and her mom was turned by Sylvia. Uh, but the dad's nowhere to be found. So we figure the dad probably got eight, maybe yeah. either by her or by the worm God, which lives in her basement, uh, <laughs> which, uh, you know, it was interesting. There's this wonderful scene, uh, even for 88, it was done really well. The um, Sylvia se- sends mom, who's now a snake disciple, uh, to go after uh, the Lord, Hugh Grant. Uh, and uh, she goes after him and she cut, he, he cuts her in half. The imagery similar to what the song was that we heard about the legend of his family killing the white worm. So there's that. But she's still alive after he cuts her in half. And there's this wonderful scene where she's dragging her other half of the body towards him. And just, just the way it looks, the way they shot it, it was very impressive for 88, I thought. It, it was. And you can see what the effect is. They've got, you know, someone with their legs sticking out of the floor, like a false mm-hmm. floor with guts and stuff. And then the actress who plays the mom's front half, like she, right. her front top half is sticking out of the floor. So it looks like, yeah, someone's been bisected and both parts are still alive, but it is such a great effect, partially because it's well lit. It's nice and dark. So right. You can, you can mm-hmm. tell that it's not, you know, all fake, but it's also, it's just really creepy because it's not something that you see done a lot. No, no. A gag. Well, I mean, practically, too, you know, done practically like that. I mean, it, it, there's one shot where she's literally laying there like that. And they just the way they lit and everything, it, it looks it's very effective. You're like, oh, damn, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, she's still alive, you know. And but it, just the way it looked was great. Um, and it's also dad's nowhere to be. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say it's it, you're going to mention the dad. I mean, that's the that's yeah. the thing that was so cool about one of the things that's cool about this movie you don't expect the the kind of trippy nightmare imagery. And we get these two kind of extended trip sequences. Right. But then, so when the mom shows up towards the end, you're, you, she's sitting watching television. It very much looks like that scene from Twilight Zone, the movie with the sister who doesn't have a mouse. She's watching TV in the room. But you're like, okay, are we watching another fantasy sequence? No, it's the mom who showed up. She shouldn't be there because... In our minds, she's disappeared, dead, whatever, been missing for a year. But right. no, she's just been hanging out here, having been turned into this creature. And that's a great reveal because you're like, oh, this is an illusion. This is actually happening to these people. And dad, yeah, has been eaten because they found his watch in the cave where the, the white worm supposedly has still been living. Um, and they figure he the, the, the watch did not get digested, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Uh, you know, so yeah, it was just, it's, it's really interesting, uh, how female centric this film really is, uh, in a lot of ways, you know, not just because your main antagonist is female, but just in general, it's involving the sisters and what the guys, yes, they kind of come to the rescue, but at the, you know, they do come to the rescue, but it, it, for the most part, their characters are almost like side characters. In a way. <clears throat> well, and I was surprised to see that Hugh Grant was like not in that main cave rescue. He was off right. with this other group of people kind of across the land. Um, so it kind of came down to, to Capaldi and, and you know, uh, so Angus and, and Mary and Eve. Right. Um, yeah, it was the, it was that was the part at the end I was trying to figure out is like, the fuck's this guy's doing they've got a tank and they mentioned something about gas in the cave but then we don't see him for a while and then after capaldi does the big heroic thing which we'll definitely talk about this final scene uh you know but we cut back to him and he's coming out of the cave with the tank i'm like what they what they what they what they do I, like, something about collapsing the cave or something and... i was confused by that too and the only thing i could think of and i'd have to go back and rewatch it because i'm probably probably mm. missed something very obvious but right it felt like they were at a different part of the cave because they were kind of like they weren't very close you could see them they're kind no, of far away and then distance, they, they yeah. meet up later i feel like they they were trying to smoke the snake out or something or they'd figured out where it was and they were driving it back towards where it ultimately right. ended up coming yeah. out of that chasm. So they're trying to make it so it couldn't escape, like basically giving it one smoking it. So it'd be one place to come up 
and that's when they right. could they could defeat it by cutting it in half or dropping a grenade in its mouth in this case. <laughs> a grenade is fine. right. I, I it wasn't too well explained, but I, I agree. I think they were at that end to try to force the snake forward. It's just not presented exactly clearly. Exactly. I mean, it's mentioned kind of in passing dialogue as he's ordering the guys, but though we hop back to Angus's heroic bagpipe playing <laughs> who used to charm all the snakes on the property, including our cop turned snake disciple. Uh, <laughs> he's playing the bagpipes in full Scottish garb. And then he injects himself with something, which you're like, what is, what is that about? And then he allows himself to get bit. And suddenly he, you know, he's paralyzed for a while. And then we do this ritual, which, Things get really weird at the end for for how things play. I mean, up until then, they've been kind of weird, but they've been playing it kind of subtly. They, and then it just goes bonkers in the in the cave from when she's full on snake uh, woman and bites Angus. From there on, this whole sequence, Ian, is just bonkers. <laughs> yeah, and she's all like <clears throat> blue and half naked and. The, you've got the you know mary and eve as we mentioned kind of like chained up on these mm -hmm. you know this is the most i think fake <laughs> the most of the movie is pretty grounded but this thing is the most it looks like a set it looks oh like, yeah it oh, looks yeah. almost like the the nightmare uh, set from nightmare on the street three dream warriors mm -hmm. at the end where they mm -hmm. go to find freddy um <clears throat> but yeah the snake comes up out of this pit and uh, uh so amanda Donahoe, uh, Sylvia, uh, Mary, she ties up, she yeah. ties up, she ties up Mary. Yeah. And she's dangling over the pit and she's going to like throw her in, but then she ends up dangling from Mary's foot. And then right. Angus shows up with a knife and starts cutting, cutting Sylvia's hand. hand. I love that. I love that. I'm not, I, there's many ways I've seen you try to, uh kick the person off and get your your goober drop hans gruber <laughs> drop you know it, there's many ways we've seen this in the past it's very few where i've seen someone take take a knife and start cutting the person's hand by the wrist off yeah it's the great <laughs> it is great and then i love i love that you know, because usually in these kinds of things, when there is like a, a limb that gets severed, yeah. it's still clinging on. But no, like once the hand is cut off, it's like that. Eh. It just falls. <laughs> muscles just go fall limp and it falls into the, the pit. Yeah. The one thing we had before that is because it's summoning the worm god, of course, there's going to be a ritual. They, they shoot this very well. So you don't see it right away. You've got. You've got Mary tied up, but she's still kind of on a platform. She's not dangling completely yet. And we've seen um, Sylvia, usually mostly from the waist up uh, for most of this. Until oh, that's uh, she's, right. I had forgot. She's, I like, ready, oh, wow. she's like ready to uh, sacrifice said virgin. Uh, but before that, there's a ritual. So Sylvia comes up. She's all dressed in blue and everything. And, and we see her you know, up until this point, like, okay. And she's got this strap on with this, this horn literally that comes to a point. Giant gold comes up. snake dick. Yeah. <laughs> it's a giant ivory or gold snake. Yeah. Uh, you know, phallic <laughs> strap on. And, and she's like walking it to the camera and the yeah, cam our POV is essentially Mary's crotch. Uh, <laughs> Ken Russell shoots it in such a way to where it's not subtle what Sylvia's intentions are because it's from behind and he brings the camera up. And of course we see, see, uh, you know, <laughs> her, where her legs are and where this, but again, the humor gets worked in here because she is just about to ready. You're like, Oh, this is really going to get kind of twisted and suddenly, okay, we're going to do this. She grabs her by the hips and she's ready to pull her on to do and then you hear this roar and she looks down and this is where while it's not explained we the, the snake shows up sooner than she expected so we figure it that's probably whatever uh de, de 
was doing in the caves was was kind of forcing the snake out so the snake shows up so she drops donahoe delivers it beautifully the way you want it she goes oh i guess no time for the ritual we got to go straight to the sacrifice <laughs> <laughs> she says it in such a wonderfully just like kind of disappointed but matter of factly the way she said it adds to the humor it, it's just like you've got this weird kind of things getting really strange and then she drops this little humorous line in a great way you're just I, I had to chuckle the way she said it she's like oh no time for the ritual we got to go straight to the sacrifice <laughs> I'm just like, and once again a woman is left unsatisfied when the snake comes too soon oh nice oh, sorry the what, um, <laughs> what? <laughs> i said subtle subtle no, i'm just kidding Chris, there wasn't really anything subtle about a gigantic uh phallic sharp pointy uh horn that she was for whatever reason going to not have her be a virgin anymore i don't understand that ritual part at all i was like so the, um, the pen, I guess, in the dream sequence, that was that was foreshadowing or force that was shadowing as that was force <laughs> But yes, Angus saves uh, the ladies, uh, and we find out what he injected himself with in was supposed to be <laughs> anti-venom. <laughs> they send the ladies off to the hospital, and yeah, he got bit, but he's okay because he took the anti-venom. So he thinks Donna, you know, De Ampton shows up. He's like, oh, hey, we, we did it. Oh, well, right. Yes, yeah, very so. And he's like, ah. I've got to get to you know to the phone and uh, that's not even Scottish. That was that was like Schwarzenegger. Was like I'm going to get to the phone now. Get to the phone. But the phone rings. He picks it up, and it's the lab. And the lab happens to say, "Yeah, uh, we mixed things up. You didn't get anti venom. You you got anti arthritis. Right. It was like anti inflammatory or something like that." (laughs) And it's like right at that moment is when he like grabs his neck and, he's like, <laughs> and he goes and he's over like, to the mirror. Oh, yeah. Man. And he's like, and, oh, crap. <laughs> and he does that subtle flick of the tongue thing. And then it ends with the great Twilight Zone, the movie. Yes. The second Twilight Zone, the movie reference I've made this. Yes, show. it is. Um, So they're driving away and Hugh Grant is like, you know, oh, let's go see the girls at the hospital. And then he's like, you want to stop and get a bite to eat? And you, you want to do you want to get a bite is all yeah you want to get a bite and then Capaldi's I, I can't remember did he say anything or just give him no he just kind of looks at him he, he just kind of smiled and looks at him because he's all sweaty and that and, and then they kind of cut to credits it's literally a Twilight Zone and it's like you want to see something really scary mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it it pull it is pulling from that completely in a beautiful way in a way that you just you know that's. You kind of wanted, that's how you, you kind of wanted this to end. On one hand, yes, you wanted it to end to where, you know, the good guys win, the, the bad snake person dies. But at the same time, the way the rest of the film was, you kind of wanted that coda a little bit like, okay, what are you going to do? And and they give you this little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the, the thing. It's like, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because no. When he's down for the count at the beginning of the cave thing, it's like, well, he just got bit by the cop and he explains that the antidote he had taken is like, it took a while for it to, to, to kick in, but kick then in, it was yeah. fine. Um, but then you realize that it was all, I guess, psychosomatic or whatever, because he had, hadn't even taken the antidote. So it's like, well, how is he surviving that snake venom then being with it enough to go rescue two girls from a snake goddess and a snake monster. And then he's fine until he gets the phone call and the phone call is the triggering event. Wait, I guess I really am screwed. It just adds to the absurdity of the whole thing. It's one Mm -hmm. of those things where it would drive me crazy, but the spirit of the film just, yeah, you gotta let it, you gotta let that go. Cause it's just so, it's such a fun gag. I don't care if they cheat a little bit to get there. (laughs) And that's the thing is by the, that's one of those things to where it shows you how a film can, by the you know it can pull stuff like that by the end of it because the rest of the film has got you so pulled in and just entertained by it that you're willing your suspension is there you're like yeah you know what i'm gonna roll with it because that was fun it doesn't make a lot of sense he should have turned sooner he should have number of questions but because it made for a fun ending for a fun movie um it is 
Yeah, it's kind of like those Looney Tunes cartoons where like <laughs> Wiley e. Coyote is chasing the Roadrunner. He ends up going over a cliff and then he doesn't realize that he should be. It's not he doesn't start falling until he looks down and realizes right, until he, he looks down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like that. It's just like that. Uh, Infobomb is also mentioning while uh, the reference is a bit obtuse. Eve is injured by Lady Sylvie. Uh, Sylvia and the blonde Donna Dixon is seen bandaged at the end of Twilight Zone, the movie. So, wow, you that's know, right. I forgot that was, yeah. was in that. And yeah, Dan Aykroyd and Donna Dixon and, ended and up being da- a thing. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, maybe a few more influences from Twilight Zone, the movie. But, you know, it, this film is just fun. Um, it, it's, it, I think it, it, it you could see why it, it has the cult following it does, not just because of the people in it, but. In general, I, this is the first time I've watched it all the way through, and I just I, I'm glad I own it because I had a bl- <laughs> I had a blast with this movie. It's it's made far better than you might expect, especially from the title and maybe even seen some of the uh, uh, trailer for it. But when you watch it, yeah, this is just this is what you want from a film like this. I would say, yeah, uh, this is the kind of thing we were talking earlier about the music box theater. Um, this, and you know, it's 1988. So next year we've got, what was that the 35th anniversary coming up? You know, maybe Ooh. wait another few years for the four. I can't believe the 40th anniversary is coming up. <laughs> um, but the, you know, the kind of thing like, yeah, bring it to like an art house theater and, you know, sell it as like Hugh Grant's, you know, cult horror comedy classic or something like that. People <laughs> like, what the fuck, Hugh? That that was my my wife's reaction when I told her, yeah, I watched this horror comedy this morning uh, starring a young Hugh Grant. She's like, what? She loves Hugh Grant. And she's like, yeah. I can't, I can't picture him being in a horror comedy. See, but he works, it, totally works. And it it falls back to what I say, folks. You know, for as much as lower budget or cult films get such a bad rap. A lot of people get their starts from these films. Now, granted, he had been uh, he had a full year in 1988. So he was quite, you know, he was quite prevalent. He was in a number of movies, but this was the start of his like explosion to where he was in a lot of feature films, either as a supporting role or or, you know, star uh, in 88. But it's still kind of interesting watching a movie like this going, wait, that's that's, you know, <laughs> that's uh, what you call its diary, Hugh Grant. That's that's the, the rom-com Hugh Grant. He was in the movie about a snake woman. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I, I will say the one thing I was as happy about, because it's like a scrappy little English production, uh, when Hugh Grant and Peter Capaldi would go on later to be, you know, big stars, mm-hmm. I'm glad they got rid of the unibrow thing because. Damn oh, it. yes. Oh, my yeah. God. Too many close ups of like, <laughs> oh, just just trip right there. Trim it. <laughs> just, just pluck it. Something a little, you know, just something there to separate it. It'd be great. <laughs> wow. So there you have it, folks. The Lair of the White Worm. Uh, Ian, would you recommend it? Mm. Highest possible recommendation. This movie is is great. And yeah, it's the, again, one of the reasons I love coming on this show is because you dig up these films that <laughs> I had either heard of and not bothered with or never heard of. And nine and a half times out of 10, they're just amazing. So, yeah, unironically, <laughs> well, this isn't this isn't some like, oh, it's a cheesy, you know, horror comedy from 88 or it's not a cheesy horror movie that's so bad. It's funny. It's a legit, well-balanced horror comedy with a great cast a tremendous story based on mm-hmm. you know a book that I now need to go read. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I think that's part of the charm is its honesty of what it's trying to be. It's not trying to be over something. It's trying to tell this film and it's just, it's well-crafted um, and it, you're right. Great balance. And yeah, I, I definitely be watching it again. I can see uh, why uh, the diva of the spoiler room, Miss Dawn, uh, enjoys it so much. Uh, you know, I could definitely see myself watching this again. Uh, well, and but- I just want to say, we, we talked about it earlier. Um, Amanda Donahoe, like her Sylvia character should be more talked about in terms mm-hmm. of like horror circles and, and villains and villainesses than 
than she is because this is a great this is a star making role for her it's it's a it's a wonderful character it, it's so so much better than you would expect in all honesty and, and she just sells the hell out of it and that's what helps make this film just so wonderful so yeah there you go folks two two positives ups for the lair of the white worm i uh, hope you've enjoyed this discussion now you're wondering well there's only one movie left in our horror of 1988 and we've been doing the taking the stab to try to determine what the film is going to be next month well i've come up with a way to where we could still take a stab so ian we've traveled the halls of the spoiler room archives and you've managed to avoid being uh, eliminated by the other flying vhs there's uh two victims in front of you you've got your killer mask and knife in hand one on the left it's number one one on the right that's number two you can only vanquish one of them the other one will become the final girl or guy or person they will become the final person and escape so what are you going to take a stab at are you going to take a stab at one or are you going to take a stab at two that was a lot of setup um i'm going to flip a pen okay uh two <laughs> two let's take a stab and find out well you stabbed C is for camp. Our last film of the horror of 1988 was Cheerleader Camp. Therefore, December is going to be Camp Horror Month. C is for camp. So we will be watching Cheerleader Camp, Sleepaway Camp, Summer Camp from 2015, and The Burning. So that is... <laughs> that is our December lineup, folks. You, you, stabbed, you stabbed the camp. You had a chance, you had a choice between stabbing cheerleader and you stabbed the camp and you stabbed the camp. So there you well, go. We'll be watching. I'm excited. Camp. So <laughs> I haven't seen cheerleader camp. Mm -hmm. I absolutely adore the burning and I haven't watched sleepaway camp in a long time. What was the fourth one? Summer camp from 2015. Yeah. You, I, you, I don't, you'll I have to look it up. One. It's, it's interesting. I'll send you the link to the trailer. It's very interesting. It's not to be confused with another summer camp, but Summer Camp 2015 is about a group of individuals who go to summer camp in Europe. And uh, yeah, where they go isn't actually a summer camp. And of course, things go awry in a very mean and nasty way. So uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> All right. I was trying to look for something a little different for camp movies. But yeah, those are the four films we will be covering in December for C is for Camp Month. Uh, take that meaning however you want. And now you can take the license to shill, Ian, and you have the floor. Go ahead, shill away for all the wonderful things you have going on over at your channel. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Ian Simmons. I run Kicking the Seat, which you can find at kickseat.com. You can also look me up on uh, YouTube. You can find me at uh, Kicking the Seat YouTube channel. Um, got a lot of uh, stuff there, interviews, reviews, roundtables, all that stuff. I just put up a video today looking at some featured extras for horror movies that I caught up from October. And I mentioned you, Mark, um, the, the the backbone of Wisconsin horror, because uh, I watched uh, the extra features on a movie called Summer of Blood, which is a horror comedy. And one of those oh, features yeah. is the director, owner to Cal, interviewing Lloyd Kaufman. Uh, and nice. apparently in the trauma prop closet, it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny interview, but it's also very, uh, very informative. Um, oh yeah. I, I think I know that. I think I know that, uh, um, interview. Yeah. Summer of blood was an interesting film. I got to see a screener and review that a long time when it first came out. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Owner's a great guy. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's, uh, I got a lot going on there um yeah so check it out we'd love to love to have you awesome yes check out all that wonderful stuff folks uh if you haven't noticed uh we have had a change with the spoiler room i've moved now on from doing it yourself for everything because i'm old uh but i decided to pull the trigger we are now on anchor.fm you can find the spoiler room and that is still getting fed out to all the major channels and such we're on eight other 
podcast feeds as well. Uh, the iTunes and stuff got updated. So that hasn't changed. So if you subscribe to that, you're still there. That's probably where you're listening to this. But it is just being hosted elsewhere now. It's not being hosted on Special Mark Productions. It's being hosted on Anchor FM. So uh, if you've got something to update or shortcuts or RSS feeds, uh, those should all automatically update. But if not, just go to Anchor FM, uh, anchor.fm slash uh, as the spoiler room podcast and you will find us and all of our episodes along with interviews and such are there. I'm still updating and changing things. It's going to probably take me a month to get through it all, but uh, yeah. So check it out there folks. Very excited and see us for camp month is next month. But before we get there next week, we're covering hiss. Yes. Hiss. Uh, very interesting film. So I, I'm looking forward to that discussion. So yeah, uh, stay tuned for that, my folks and friends are, out there. And, and are we going to do a special episode on hers? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't. I don't know if there's a film like that, but now that you mentioned it with the internet, there probably is now. So it now has been created. So there you have it, folks. We're creating our ending here. Thank you so much for listening. And I would just say a good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>